At the age of 14, I was in junior high school, trying to figure out how I was going to get through life as a gay man without any role models or the internet. The future looked hopeless. I was living in Cameroon at that time. A woman asked me if I was gay and suggested I go to Mykonos. I did go to Mykonos. I went to the beach, met a man and came out that day. William Jefferson Clinton was the first person running for President of the United States to say the word gay. Together with three other gays, I started an LGBT group to help elect Clinton president. After eight years of strong progress for LGBT people, George W. Bush took over as US president. My mother told me she was getting older and that I needed to marry Mark soon, even if it wasn't legal. I legally married Mark Hemans in a big church in Minnesota in front of 350 of our friends and families. Can you believe it? Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome businessman and LGBT activist Charlie Rounds. Fifty years ago is this picture. So, uh, 1964, you see a nice little fat gay boy on the picture, and in front of you, you see a relatively nice fat gay man. Um, there's a long story in 50 years, and it's hard to be up here and speak tonight after some of the stories that we heard. Uh, I lived in Cameroon. I know the horror of Cameroon. And what I think we can never forget about Cameroon is it's not just horrible for gay people. It's horrible for women. It's horrible for Muslims. And in the countries next door, it's horrible for Christians. And as we look at global human rights and we look at our fight and our struggle, let's never forget that there are so many other people that fight every day for the same rights. And when we work with them, we will get to the end of the road. But tonight, I need to talk to you about dreams. And I hope that you all, while I'm up here speaking, think of some of the dreams that each one of you had. Whether it's related to being LGBT or not, think about dreams. Because when you don't have dreams, you lose hope. And when you lose hope, you give up the fight. And tonight is about the fight. Trust me. So in 1979, I survived high school. I'm in Cameroon. And this magazine is sent to my home in Creepy, Cameroon, with these beautiful beaches. And out comes this magazine. I know I was gay. I know I was gay since probably eight or nine years old. But I'm hiding in Cameroon because I don't want to have to deal with it. And out comes this article in 1979, and I get this copy of Time magazine. And I look at it and I said, I'm probably going to eventually have to stop hiding. Because there were people in 1979, and it was not like the Ukraine, and it was not like at the time, Czechoslovakia, it was never like Cameroon, ever. But it was still difficult, and people were out and putting their lives and their jobs on the line. And I thought, it's time to get, excuse my English, some fucking courage. So, Mykonos, you already heard the story, but I need to tell you that what led up to it. 1981, I'm in bed with this woman, we're trying to have sex, getting working. Um, and she was this wonderful woman who was a trained sex therapist. And she looked down and said, have you ever thought you were gay? And I'm not even going to tell you where she was looking when she asked that. <laughs> and I said, Yes. And she said, you need to go to Mykonos. There's a beach. It's called Super Paradise Beach. You need to go there. You need to meet a guy. You need to take him back to your hotel. And you need to have sex. And let's see if it works a little better than it's working right now, or in this case, not working right now. And so I did. And I did. I was 26 years old. I met a 19-year-old, half-American, half-Colombian. We went back to the room. We had sex like the Katy Perry video in Budapest, the lights, the fireworks. <laughs> but I have, to, I have to tell you, it wasn't the multiple orgasms of that night. It was waking up to him the next morning. And Yana, I won't cry. Um, and, and looking at him and saying, the closet door is gone. And so um, from Mykonos, 
the closet door was gone. My parents fully Greece. I came out to them in Greece, right there, my poor dad's retirement party, and he <laughs> learns his thumbs of bad. So I go home, out to my family, unbelievably easy coming out. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. Easy coming out, friends and family. So it's two years later, and we're talking about dreams. The dreams right now in 1983 America is that you're not going to die with HIV AIDS. It was a different time. The horrible thing is we were dying from AIDS. The positive that came from this, though, is we were forced out. We were forced into community. We actually worked together. Lesbians, the lesbian community was there for us. The lesbians were out leading ACT UP and other organizations. And we came together as men and women. And we knew had we to survive. We had to fight this disease. So in 1983, your dreams of this happy gay life all of a sudden is really hardened with HIV AIDS. 1988, five years later, I get a job. Instead of taking high school kids to France, I have to take 800 gay men on a boat. And this is 800 gay men on a boat. Now you have to realize it was pretty amazing in 1988. How many of you were born after 1988 in the room? Um, think about that. That you actually worked and went to work every day in 1988 as a gay person. And that what you got to do was have people from all over America come together, and we were the majority community for that week. You touched, you never thought twice about touching the person next to you. And that's what I got to do for many, many years. So now I'm out, friends and family. I've got a great gay job. I don't have a husband. Oh, sorry, one slide before the husband. This is not my husband. Um, I don't know if I'd want Bill Clinton as my husband. Uh, we talked earlier on the slide, 1992, in his nomination speech to the Democratic Committee at a national uh, convention, Bill Clinton says and talks about discrimination against gay people. And we knew, we knew we had to come together and elect this man president. He wasn't perfect. He didn't pass all the perfect laws that we wanted. But he said the word gay. And after he was elected, he appointed openly gay people. And so now, I'm out. I've got the job. We're political. Things are starting to look good. I still don't have the husband. Six years later, two men in this room, and I do want them to stand up, Don and Jerry. Come on, stand up, boys. Um, this is the invitation to their 25th anniversary. 25th anniversary in 1998. These two guys had been together since 1973 as a loving couple for 41 years. Both of them school teachers. <laughs> Openly gay school teachers that formed the lives of tens of thousands. And it was at this event, because I am a gay man, I was there with my mother, and my mother pointed out on the steps and said, that guy looks really cute, ask him out. So you always do what mom does. And that is when I met my husband, who would be my husband last year, Mark. So 1998, we were not thinking people of legalized marriage. We just weren't, for the most part. Six years later, 2004, the Supreme Court of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts made a decision that marriage had to be legal in the state of Massachusetts. We had to win two legislative sessions in 2004, which we did, and so Massachusetts became the first American state. That is 2004. I want to flash forward four years. Ben, you talked about this so eloquently. My husband and I, not legal at the time, were down the fact that we elected a black president. And again, I want to talk about how important when we talk and think about other minorities. That night, the descendant of, not slaves, because his father came from Kenya, but his wife, a descendant of slaves, we elected him president of the United States. And that was something that helped all Americans, not just African Americans. But that night of joy, and I've got to tell you, on the open champagne bottles, because of Proposition 8, we lost. We lost in the state of California, the craziest people on earth, Hollywood, San Francisco, and we still lost. 
But we knew we couldn't give up. We had to keep fighting. 2012, four years later. Tammy Baldwin, if you don't know who she is, she's a lesbian farm girl from Wisconsin. She was elected senator from the state of Wisconsin. That means the entire state of Wisconsin voted for Tammy Baldwin. We won open lesbian senator, and the four states on marriage, we won all four of them. That night, the tide had changed. The closet door was gone. Marriage, eventually we knew we were going to win. And so, talking about dreams, and I'm gonna end with my dreams, and then I wanna talk about other dreams. This is my husband, Mark, who we were married on October 5th, 2013, in front of 350 people in a very religious service. And it was something that I will guarantee you in that first slide, 50 years ago, I never dreamt would happen. But it did happen, and it happened because of a whole bunch of people across this globe that have continued to work for LGBT rights. And this is at the White House. In 2013, I was at the White House three times. Three times as an openly gay man to be invited by the President of the United States. That's how far we've come. But let's talk about the other challenges. Let's talk about dreams from around the world. As I sat today with this incredible group of activists from around Eastern Europe, and I've listened to your stories, is we have to remember as Americans, some of us that have everything, that it is our duty, it is our job, it is our responsibility to help the rest of you. This is Evan Wolfson. If you don't know Evan, he started Freedom to Marry in the United States. He has seen defeats. He has seen, as Ben Cohen talked about Stonewall, so many of us, including myself, said, Evan, give up on marriage. There's other stuff to fight for. And Evan never, ever gave up. And it is probably we got marriage in the United States faster because of this singular man. And I just want to read briefly. Evan said, in essence, I always believed it is our obligation to make the world better and always believed that we could win. He always believed that we could win, and so he never stopped fighting. So, there's Evan. Um, Dane Lewis, the head of J-Flag. Dane is an openly gay man in Jamaica. This is not an easy thing. But Dane never, ever gives up. And I just want to read, I call these people and ask them about their dreams. Here's what Dane said. My dream is for every LGBT Jamaican to be embraced by family and friends for who we are. As Jamaica celebrates 51 years as an independent nation, I dream for the realization of our national motto. And here is that motto of Jamaica, out of many, one people. Okay, I'm not gonna cry. Um, this is Jackson Jansen. Jackson Jansen is a transgender man. He is the head of the Western Wisconsin LGBT Center. Uh, he gets up every single day. He grew up in rural Texas and talks about those stories many of us heard as a boy or as a girl. He talks about finally finding community as a lesbian and then still he knew that that wasn't where he needed to be. And so he made the decision to transition. And again, such a difficult decision. Where would he still be after transition with family and friends? But I gotta tell you, I gotta just read these couple of quotes. Um, I never, this is from Jackson, I never dreamt in this moment of so much victory that I would feel simultaneously like we have climbed a mountain and we have not even moved five centimeters. And in the end, he said, I never dreamt, I know this feeling deep in my core that every day I'm willing to get up, to be visible, and to focus to make the life of one person or community better, that I'm creating a ripple that will live beyond me that will live beyond him. And lastly, because I always do whatever Chesla asks me to do, and I do want to thank Chesla and Prague Pride, and especially the Czech Republic, 
Uh, I think you guys are beacons and, and keep doing what you're doing. This is Jacob. He is from China. He is 31 years old. He told me the story very briefly. I said, Jacob, tell me about your dreams. He said, Charlie, a whole generation of Chinese, we have no dreams. And it's about conformity. He talked about the young boy in his village whose parents beat him and beat him, not because he was gay, because he was left-handed. Just because he was left-handed, and that is conformity in China. But I want you to read this now. I want to read this now, and where East meets West. This is what Jacob said when he finally came out. I started to volunteer for LGBT NGOs at the age of 20, and I don't know how much I can change, but at least I know I'm living my full life and going after the dream that I'm doing something. My father once said to me, I'm proud of you, son, but you are one person. You can't change the world. And Jacob said, I am going to change the world. And I think he will. 